I was three years old when we pulled up to mom's house. It had only been a short 15 minute drive, but still, I was confused. Wait, but why can't we stay with dad today? My older brother called back from the front seat. Duh, because we're divorced. What? I looked to mom's face in the rearview mirror. No one had told me about this. We're not married, but I didn't know we were divorced. My brother huffed. Five years old and he was already cursed with knowing everything. Not being married is divorced, stupid. Mom scolded him for calling me a name and I shook my head alone in the back seat. I was blown away all this time. Divorced? That word had such a nasty feel to it. It meant families shouting, tearing apart, exploding in tears, slamming doors. Nothing that I'd experienced in life so far. I couldn't remember mom and dad ever living together, but their houses were close and we had a schedule. Dad drew it out on a piece of paper and explained it to me. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you'll be with your mom and then Tuesday, Thursday, you'll be with me. We'll switch off weekends. That way, we split the time evenly. It was logical, it was fair, and above all else, it was normal. This was not only the way that a family could work, but the way a family should work. This was no accident. Mom and dad never wanted my brother or I to feel like we were somehow responsible for what had happened, or that there was something wrong with us because our parents were separated. Mom never said a bad word about dad, and dad never said anything negative about mom either. There was no yelling or fighting over who would go where at what time. When mom and dad met, they traded pleasantries and passed my brother and me off like two little blonde-haired batons. <laughs> of course, despite the adult's efforts to be positive, I still had the standard divorced kid fantasies of mom and dad getting back together. Movies like The Parent Trap, Liar Liar, and other Hollywood stories where feuding parents found a way to live happily ever after did not help. But for the most part, I felt that my family was a happy one until I turned nine and mom got a new job four hours down the coast in San Luis Obispo, voiding our oh-so-normal weekly schedule. Now where would I, my brother and I stay? I imagine that it wasn't an easy decision. We'd enjoyed growing up in Oakland, but my parents had some reservations about the schools. We'd already been through two teacher strikes in Oakland Unified, and from my parents' perspective, the schools weren't improving. Next year, my brother was going to be in middle school, and mom started to think about what kind of school she wanted us to grow up with. That summer, my brother and I packed our things. The day we left, I sat in the middle seat of dad's Dodge Dakota, squished and sweaty between him and my brother. The cab was musky and stale, and the sun beat down through the windows. Looking up, I could see tears forming under his glasses. It was the first time I saw him cry. He wiped his fingers under his glasses and waved goodbye as my brother and I pulled away with mom. San Luis Obispo had uncrowded streets, and the hills were brown and full of boulders instead of houses. I spent a lot of time in the back seat of mom's blazer, watching rows of tilled soil, power lines, and cattle fly by. We crossed town in 15 minutes on windy two-lane roads. It took time to adjust to the quiet and the open spaces, but I enjoyed riding my bike around our new seaside neighborhood and out to the cliffs and running cottontail rabbits off the path. What I couldn't get used to was our new family schedule. My brother and I would spend the school year with mom and summers with dad. Dad would also plan to come down two weekends every month to visit. See, said mom, it's still fair. Half the year with dad and half the year with me. Weekends with dad became routine. It started with a big hug. He missed me, he'd say. I missed him, I'd say. Then I'd put my overnight bag in his car and we'd drive to a nearby hotel. We'd put the music on loud, roll the windows down, and the three of us would bounce in our seats all smiling and giddy. He took us out to pizza and gave us rolls of quarters for the games. Or we'd go to the movies, or even out to pricey seafood places where they had desserts with fancy names like tiramisu and creme brulee. <laughs> Whatever we wanted. We ate junk food and stayed up late watching TV at the hotel. 
It was like we were trying to cram all the fun, all the hugs, all the good feeling of two weeks into two days. Time together wasn't just normal anymore. It was precious. Then the end came. Dad changed when he dropped us off back at the house. He hugged me like he didn't want to let go. He told us he loved us over and over. He moved slowly back to the car, lingering. He waved politely to mom, then to us, and I saw the pain in his face. These visits meant so much to him, and they were over so quickly. My chest ached as he drove away, like dad had a line of rope that ran back to me and pulled, but I stayed put. Mom shooed us inside, made sure we packed our things for school, and asked us what we'd been up to, as if it had been any old weekend spent roaming the neighborhood with friends. Sometimes I didn't want him to, to visit, because that meant we'd have to say goodbye, and I'd have to feel my heart get pulled out again. I'd have to feel the fantasy of everything being normal and happy dissolve. Some weekends, when we were supposed to be having a good time, all I could think about was the inevitable Sunday evening and its slow orange sunset. I thought about my family at night, alone in my room, watching the time on my alarm clock turn from p.m. to a.m. I wrote about it, filling a spiral-bound notebook with rants and questions and keeping it under my bed. But I never talked to anyone about it. Mom never looked sad, at least not in front of my brother and I. She came straight from work to pick us up at swim practice, still dressed in her pantsuit and heels. She scoured our report cards for anything less than A's and stretched her limited cooking abilities in a move to eliminate sugar and salt from our diet. Lots of lentils, cooked to death chicken, and brown rice was served. We ate dinner late, mom collapsing in her chair, closing her eyes with the simple pleasure of sitting. Who was I to bring up something painful out of the blue? If I told dad, I was afraid it would ruin our precious time together. If I told mom, I was afraid that somehow my discontent would change our bustling and happy home. I wanted to tell someone how I felt, but I was embarrassed about it. I wasn't supposed to be sad. I was supposed to be normal, positive, healthy. And I couldn't say anything without admitting that I wasn't. In the sixth grade, they passed around papers for parents to sign. Emergency forms, permission slips, questionnaires, a whole stack of pastel colored paper that mom would look at that night. One of them caught my eye. Banana splits, it read. A support group and ice cream social for students with divorced parents. That's me, I thought. That paper is talking about me. Were there other kids who felt like me? who wanted to talk about their feelings and eat ice cream? <laughs> Could banana splits be the answer to all of my problems? <laughs> I slipped the paper into my stack to bring home that night. I'd seen mom work through stuff like this before, filling in boxes, initially signing, dating, pulling her hair at every mistake she made. Hopefully she'd just sign and move on, and then I wouldn't have to talk to her about it. After dinner, I handed <clears throat> over the stack and went to my room to pace, waiting for her to call me and collect the completed forms. What if she found it? What if she knew I was sad? What would she say? Would I be in trouble? Gary? Her voice came through the house. I met her at the kitchen table. What's, what's this? She held up a blue paper. Banana splits. My face got hot. It's this uh, thing um, where they talk about stuff. My friend told me about it. You know you can talk to me about anything. Mom furrowed her brow, concerned. You know that, right? I nodded. I just saw that there was free ice cream, so... <laughs> I looked at the paper in her hand, still hoping that she'd put it down and sign it. But inside I shrank. She put it back in the stack of papers, unsigned, and clipped the stack together and held it out. Are you sure you're okay? She asked me in a pleading way, a way that said, please tell me you're okay. Please tell me that I made the right choice in coming here, uprooting our family, 
starting a new life. You did, Mom. San Luis Obispo, with you, is home. There's just this other thing in the pit of my stomach, nagging, and I don't know if I have the courage to tell you. I'm fine, I said, and took the stack of papers back to my room. That was Gary Gold.